Hey, and welcome back, everybody. So this is going to be the last installment of our IB Global Politics unit on peace and conflict. So the last time we were talking about theoretical models, what a theoretical model is, of course, is a pattern that is recognized by political scientists in this instance that helps to explain examples of conflict or examples of whatever political phenomenon that the model is trying to explain. In this case, we're talking about peace and conflict. So in the last installment, we looked at the conflict helix model in which the political scientist R.J. Rummel described conflict as a necessary part of a cycle of society building that can collapse, of course, and have to start over again. Society building fundamentally based on the notion of the social contract. Today, we're going to talk about a different kind of theoretical model, one that describes war specifically. And in this instance, we're going to be talking about the distinction between a concept or a descriptive term called new wars and a descriptive term called old wars. So the new wars is a way of describing conflict that has mostly characterized the post-Cold War world. And old wars would characterize the world of great power states. So the world between kind of the late 1800s and the end of the Cold War. Okay, so you can see this distinction illustrated in this table here. What is being demonstrated in this table is that the type of state that was going to war, the type of strategy that was used in war, and the actual objectives of war were different historically than they are today. And so this is illustrated in this table. We can see here that in the 1600s and 1700s, the type of political institution that was generally waging war was a monarchy, an absolutist state. The goals were for the state type of reasons, dynastic conflict, the succession of power, the consolidation of borders, the attempt to expand territorial interests. The type of army was typically mercenary and professional. And while there was the use of firearms, there were often sieges of cities and defensive kinds of maneuvers that would not re really characterize a post-industrial kind of military conflict. Now, in terms of the war economy, how you would actually organize the society to fund and support a war effort. Well, under a monarchy, the regularization of taxation and borrowing became the norm. So you would actually increase taxes on your citizens and you'd borrow gold from other uh, banks or monarchies, etc. You'd make alliances in this way. Well, the war economy is going to get a lot more efficient, as are the actual uh, techniques of war. So as we see into the 1800s, nationalism prevails over monarchy and nation states are going to war. These are conflicts over national identity, over national boundaries, access to resources, etc. Typically, nations are now using conscription. They are actually drafting soldiers into war and training them to be professionals, or professionals are training the conscripts to become the next generation of professionals. Industrialization led to railways and different communication techniques and military. And of course, the state ends up becoming much more bureaucratic and expanded in power and, and uh, capacity in order to fund a war effort in the 1800s. Once we get into the world wars in the early 1900s, you start to see these alliances wage wars. So multinational states and empires are waging wars over national and ideological conflict, conflict like Nazism versus the preference for democracy. Mass armies, were amassed in the industrial period through totalizing all the resources of society towards the effort of war. And this led to massive amounts of firepower, industrialized warfare with tanks and aircrafts and bombs, and of course, eventually, the weapons of mass destruction. What you saw in World War II was an economy that was mobilized specifically for the war effort. So the state took over vast measures of production in order to actually support the war effort, to build tanks, to build boots, to peel potatoes, whatever the military needed, society mobilized its resources towards that. Now what Caldor is going to describe is that this kind of warfare has changed, that no longer are we fighting wars really 
waged amongst states. Interstate conflict is not really happening like it did a hundred years ago. That more and more we're seeing that these kind of ideological blocks or these identity blocks are going into conflict with essentially alliances that have grown out of globalization. So we'll talk about that more. There is still ideological conflict. Much of the conflict today is defined along religious lines, but certainly along kind of anti-globalization ideology. The type of army is very different today. There is much more of a reduction in the actual amount of force and much more of an emphasis on logistics and coordination and technology amongst the more elite armies. Of course, we have weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons, and there is an entire military industrial complex that exists military industrial complex, excuse me, that exists solely for the purpose of producing weapons, uniforms, logistical technology, communications technology, etc, 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 for the military. The government contracts float a huge sector of our economy. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a reading from this British professor named Mary Caldor. And this is from a book called New and Old Wars. And she comes up with a very interesting theoretical way of describing the difference in conflict today as it relates to older days, the 20th century and before. And she's essentially saying that the Westphalian peace that created the nation states created a particular kind of conflict. And today that has changed, that conflict is mostly decentralized today. That you see, yes, some, some huge nation states operate military operations in various places, but it involves a lot of non-military activity. It involves non-governmental organizations. It involves multinational corporations. And these interests that are now fighting wars are globalized. They transcend the traditional boundaries and norms of the old style of warfare. And there's a new particular kind of conflict that's emerging amongst this globalized system. So, if we're trying to describe the old wars, the wars that characterized the period after the Westphalian peace, through the end of the Cold War, the conflicts are predominantly driven by the interests of nation states. So states in the Peace of Westphalia were essentially given the legitimate control of use of violence in society. And therefore, you saw the military apparatus grow from that. You saw uniformed soldiers and all these kind of symbols of the legitimate use of force in society on behalf of your nation state, on behalf of your nationality, your people. And so your nationality had geopolitical goals. It may want independence from a particular monarchy. It may need access to particular farmland or, or water resources, etc., etc. And that essentially drove conflict for most of this time period. Now, to win a war in an old war, you wanted to advance your military into territory. And you would typically have to engage in combat between these units of soldiers. So you'd have uniformed soldiers on one side representing a nation state and uniformed soldiers on another side representing a nation state that were professionally trained. You had laws, you had some unwritten laws and some laws that were agreed upon by treaty as to how you fought these conflicts. So these rules emerged to keep the distinction essentially between the military and the civilian spheres. So in the Westphalian era, this is a really interesting statistic. If you measure the military to civilian casualties, typically you'd have about nine military casualties per every civilian death. And you're gonna see that in the new wars, that's very much the opposite. So what we see emerge from this time period is an industrial push to heavy armaments and alliances. So this is what characterized the world wars. They became so powerful that conventional war is now just too costly. It's now counter to state interests to actually engage in a conventional war. So with arms races of the 20th century and nuclear weapons and all that emerged from this kind of style of conflict, it now doesn't even make any sense to fight this kind of war anymore. So let's fast forward to the time period since the 1980s and 90s when the Soviet Union fell and the world was realigned into more of a globalized multilateral uh, in some ways unilateral system run by the United States but a multilateral kind of democratic system organized through the United Nations the World Bank etc etc 
what we started to see emerge, especially in places like Eastern Europe, in the Middle East and North Africa, in Central and Southern Africa, and in Asia, was this different kind of conflict, this much more decentralized kind of conflict. So what you see today is that military groups are often not necessarily associated with a particular country. If we look at ISIS or ISIL, right, Islamic State in Syria, Islamic State in Lebanon, there's also an Islamic State for the Zagreb, which is a kind of region of North Africa. These are ideologically connected, but they're not really wearing a uniform. They're not necessarily representing a particular nation state. They're uh, an ideological cause, looking for broad reforms across an entire region. And this leads to a lot more blurring between the civilian and the military sphere. So what we've seen today is an actual flipping that the military to civilian casualties has now almost directly inverted. For every one military death, we now average about eight civilian deaths in the wars since the 1990s. So that's kind of a terrible development because enemies are not wearing a uniform anymore. Our military will go into places not really knowing who the enemy is. And often the enemy is camouflaged as civilians. And that can lead to a lot more collateral damage, a lot more civilian deaths, and much more blurring between who is clearly the enemy and who might be an ally. Now, what this also means is that you typically have a lot more international involvement. So when there's conflict in the world today, you have all these international institutions, the United Nations, and all these supranational structures like the African Union or the European Union that often have interest in these conflicts and will get involved frequently. All right, so one last aspect of new wars that I want to talk about, and then I think I'm going to actually have to cut this off and continue this next time, is that new wars, much more so than old wars, involve, involve private military contractors. So for-profit companies, you can look them up. Uh, the last time I looked, I think there were 119 such companies in the world. Uh, these are essentially mercenary groups or technology groups that contract with the military to do all different kinds of aspects of war. So this is very, very different. We're dealing with a different kind of enemy. And since we're dealing with more of a population control, population relationships, urban warfare, um, as opposed to having kind of military control over a place by bringing in the tanks, more often we are hiring private contractors to try to develop relationships and even do a lot of kind of dirty type of espionage. Um, but this has kind of led to a lot of different questions about international law. First of all, some of the things that were traditionally not authorized in, in more traditional warfare have kind of propped up a lot more. So landmines have been a real tool of insurgencies in the Cold War world. And they have become much more of the norm in conflict today. Uh, IEDs are the same thing. So instead of going up against a military target that you know is out there, you're much more likely to see what's called an improvised explosive device, a roadside bomb that could be set off with a cell phone from a, a great distance. Uh, these kinds of things have proliferated in the world of private military contractors. Also, we've seen less of a coalescence of forces around traditional nationalism. So because so many more mercenaries are involved, very often the troops that are fighting in the, in the actual conflict are not necessarily associated with a particular nation state. Rather, they are more likely to be associated with identity politics. Now, you've probably heard this term before. It may have a very negative connotation uh, in the way that you've heard it before. This is not the way that... Mary Caldor uses the term identity politics. So this is what we're going to get into in more detail next time. But what you end up having is in a, in a more decentralized type of conflict where there's more private contractors involved, there's not necessarily clear division along national lines. It's very hard to maintain a legitimacy of force and control. And therefore, it's a lot more easy to lose legitimate control in a conflict situation today. And that may be one of the reasons why the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are now, I think, the longest wars we've ever been involved in as, the, as a country. Anyway, I hope this gives you something to think about. I'll leave a question for you guys in Edmodo, and we'll continue this with part two the next time. Take care, everybody.